Squad-based turn-based tactical strategies are some of my most favorite games. And if they mix genres, dipping into something else like base management, role-playing mechanics and deep storytelling, or even better, all of these, then I know I'm in for a really, really good time. And while those may have not had hundreds of these, since they've been actually in their golden years in the last decade or so, getting a lot of releases from both major publishers and indie devs, it still had an excellent set of games and at least one amazing title dropped each year. This video will cover their subject in particular, focusing on a single best title per year, as picked by the Moby Games website users. So, without further ado, let's check them out. Bridge is a turn-based tactical squad-based game in a futuristic space setting. It comes pre-built with 10 missions and you go through them with a squad of usually 5 space marines under a command of a team leader. And he is the only person on that team that gains experience and develops his stats after each mission completed. Mission objectives may vary considerably and they range from hostage rescue through crucial data retrieval to elimination of all opposing forces. You know, what your usual set of special forces missions would be. I mean, I'm guessing as I've never been in any kind of forces, but you have. You save the universe, alone leading teams and whole armies, so dealing with a simple hostage situation or some terrorists should not be an issue for you really. Now should it? All units move and act in turns using points-based action system, in which each action or a square of movement uses a certain portion of these. Most maps are multi-leveled and include outside terrain and buildings that can be numerous stories high. Additional weapons and support items like shields, medikits and scanners can be found throughout the map, picked up and used. Interestingly enough, only aforementioned team leader develops from mission to mission and the team for each encounter is brand new and assigned automatically to him. So you could say that while missions are team oriented, the overarching game is entirely focused on your squad leader character. If he gets killed, the game deletes his corresponding file permanently and there is no way of ever recovering it. So keep that in mind when attempting especially daring attacks. It's an interesting idea and one of the first iterations of the Iron Man mode. So if you like challenging gameplay, it's definitely here. Additionally, Bridge came with included scenario editor that can theoretically expand the game's replayability indefinitely. So yeah, that's cool too. While first Bridge was innovative, second was iterative. And I don't mean it in a bad way. It didn't reinvent the wheel, it just took what the first game did and made it bigger and better, polishing it to become more complete and enjoyable package. Same as previously, you start by picking up your squad leader and then the mission out of a dozen or so available ones. The game automatically assigns troops to the leader and then all of you are teleported to the mission location. The leader moves first and then all of his teammates, one by one in turn-based fashion. There are items to be found and equipped in the locations that you'll visit and they are very useful and helpful, stuff like gravity boots, laser shields or even grenades. You know, your typical armament of destruction, or used to avoid said destruction to happen to your squad. Missions are rather varied and have unique and interesting objectives, so you'll be rescuing an imprisoned commanding officer, crossing a river under enemy control, or trying to down an assassin that's actively hunting your team. You won't get bored with variety of tasks in Bridge 2 is what I'm saying, and you'll be killing aliens left and right, always in an interesting and very demanding setting. While Bridge 2 may not be as difficult as UFO slash XCOM games are, it's not a walk in the park either, and will put your tactical skills to the test most throughout its run. Short of a few easier encounters, that is. All that said, the most important addition, aspect, if you will, of Bridge 2 is the inclusion of a built-in mission editor, that not only extends the life of it exponentially, but also allows you to challenge your friends in your creations, crafting devilishly demanding challenges for them to beat. Interestingly enough, the developers of Omnitrend software made Bridge 2 a part of their so-called IGS, interlocking game system. Meaning, if you had Bridge 2 and their other game, Rules of Engagement, then all the combat encounters in that other game, instead of being simulated, could be played in Bridge 2's engine for even more immersion. It's not a practice that was popular back then, but definitely made owning both games even more fun experience. Hero Quest is a direct port of a real-life tabletop role-playing game of the same title, and as such follows all the rules of the original almost to the letter, from dungeons through all the enemies that you'll encounter to skills and combat. Spells and gear too are directly digitized from the analog source and thematically fitting. Heck, even the missions are identical to those found in the original. 
That said, maps are a bit different to those in tabletop games, so even former game masters could play the computer iteration and enjoy it. And HeroQuest, even if fantasy themed, is still at its heart a squad based tactical game with turn based encounters. It looks and sounds great, and presentation wise at least there's nothing to pick on here. That said, while HeroQuest is not a bad game in any way, there's just something missing here. Perhaps playing it alone was not intended by creators of the tabletop original, and I use perhaps here rhetorically. But having to go through similar adventures completely alone, sitting in the dark and looking at rhythmically blinking computer screen is just not the same as playing a game with friends gathered around the table in somebody's kitchen. Also, the use of warning prompts is just terrible. Each and every action you take, be it movement, casting spells or attacks, require you to click on a tiny OK to confirm it, which becomes tedious fast especially if you have a large distance to cover. In the same time, when a monster attacks you, all you really know is if you survived the attack or not. So while you're being showered with prompts when not necessary, when you would actually need to know how many hit points worth of damage you've sustained and if your character blocked the attack or not, you're given no usable feedback. All in all, Hero Quest is an interesting game, fun despite its shortcomings tactical fantasy role-playing and a title that was soon bettered by its own sequel. Laser Squad requires you to laser focus, to give it your best and be ready for anything, anywhere and at all times. But who am I talking to? You're you and you've been born ready. Joystick in one hand, M16 in another. It must have been an uncomfortable for everyone involved birth. Anyway, Laser Squad originally released in 1988 on ZX Spectrum and C64 and then was ported to a whole line of other 8 and 16-bit machines, PC being one of the last few ports to arrive. It's a turn-based tactics game designed by Julian Golob, who you may know as one of the two Golob brothers and a design mastermind responsible for later UFO Enemy Unknown, aka XCOM UFO Defense. A title that started my beloved tactical alien ass-kicking series. Coming back to Laser Squad though, it's a game composed out of five unique and challenging missions. First is called The Assassins and sees you facing down a man named Sterner Ragnix and his guards. In short, he's the bad one, you're the good ones and he needs to be put down. Second, Moonbase Assault, equally is cool name for the mission I must add, in which you have to break in and destroy the Omnicorp database, surviving the breach yourself. Rescue from the Mines, probably the weakest in the naming challenge, sees you rescuing three squad members imprisoned in the Meralix Corp mines. The Cyber Hordes, also a really cool name, has you defending a rebel station and most importantly its stabilizer cores, whatever they are, from an onslaught of invading droids. And finally, Paradise Valley, following the previous one, sees you escaping the colony with the blueprints of an advanced starfighter. Each of those missions is different in its team, but mechanically they all work the same. All units in your squad have a set number of action points, as you'd expect them to, and use them to move, perform various actions and shoot. What's most notable about Laser Squad though, is that it introduced a simple morale system, a progenitor to the one found later on in the UFO. So, if one of the units keeps missing shots, getting wounded or witnesses a teammate's death, he can become shaken and panic. While panicking, he will run out of your control. You know, how people do when they actually panic. Laser Squad was a cornerstone, on which most other notable future turn-based tactic games were based on. One of the most important games in the entire history of gaming, and a pretty fun and challenging title in its own right. Strike Squad, like most other games on this list, is a mixture of strategy and role-playing with tactical turn-based squad combat. So, you know, what I like most in my games. It takes place in the distant future, when the universe is in large part explored and colonized, and you assume a role of mercenary commander. You have your own ship, it's not great, but it's yours, and a crew that you can for the most part count on. Also, some starting cash. Not much of it, but enough to get you going. The big evil of the game are the insect-like Kakisitic, a warmongering race that destroyed your home planet, killing all your loved ones in the process and by doing so establishing themselves as the villains of your adventure. So your overall goal is to track them down and destroy them. But you can't just go and attack them willy-nilly hoping for the best and expecting the worst, because you neither know where they are nor are ready to do so. So you'll have to do a lot of planet hopping, talking to NPCs and finding necessary items and clues for the alien's location. In the same time, training your mercenaries in combat encounters so that they would be ready for the final showdown whenever it may come to be. For each planet that you visit, you pick a foreman away team and they all differ in skills and weaponry that they have, so you must pick the best mixture for what you expect to find on the surface. Each mercenary also gets paid differently, so juggling their skills, weaponry and support cost is what you'll have to always have in the back of your head, not to go bankrupt as that's an instant game over. Naturally, if you can spend money, there's gotta be a way to earn it too. And there is. You get it for completing certain mission objectives and for selling loot found after battles from fallen enemies. You only ever control one person from your former 
performant team, with the rest following and being directed by the CPU. Controlled by the CPU in turn-based combat? What gifts, you may wonder? Well, have no fear, the AI controls your teammates in real-time mode only, and you have a choice of both for combat, whichever you prefer. In turns, it's all you and you alone. So naturally, it's the option I gravitate towards when checking Strike Squad out. If all that sounded interesting to you at all, definitely check it out, it's worth it. UFO Enemy Unknown is one of my favorite and most important games of all time and an excellent start to the series that I still play to this day, albeit in newer, modern outings of XCOM and XCOM 2 by Firaxis. It's a mixture of ground strategy with tactical combat encounters and base management. Explosive mixture that delivers a lot of fun, given it was run on an appropriately fast system. Today, UFO is probably best played using either Steam or GOG versions, as they run excellent on any piece of hardware from the last 20 years and can be enjoyed on even the potatoest of machines. Yep, I'm aware there's no such word and I'm using it anyway, cause that's how much of a rebel I am. Or actually there was no such word, cause now there is. Anyway, the game as mentioned initially is a mixture of genres, so you have your strategic layer where you're seeing a globe in its full glory, oceans, continents, cities and the likes, and you can set up your bases there, detect alien ships and their hidden bases, and also command your ships to either shoot the enemy down or take your troops to various mission sites be it downed ships, terror sites or set bases. Then there's the management bit, where you're in full control of your base's design and expansion, adding rooms as needed, each with its unique properties and functions, hire soldiers, scientists and engineers, research, manufacture and arm both, your units and ships, buy and sell gear and loot from defeated aliens, in short, survive to make sure that the world will too. Arguably, outside of the missions, this is where you spend most of your time, and it's nearly as important part of the game as combat. And finally, a tactical layer, where you take your team to tackle the alien scum directly on the ground, and it's what you'll easily be doing the most of. It is also the best part of the game, equally as horror-inducing as it is invigorating. Controlling all your units individually in turn-based, very atmospheric, extremely difficult and even more so rewarding combat. And even though UFO is a game that's played entirely in turns, whomever played it can confirm that it still can be called without a shroud of a doubt, action-packed. Because while it's not real time, it's definitely blood pressure raising and often terrifying experience. XCOM Terror from the Deep is a sequel to Year Prior's UFO Enemy Unknown and easily one of the best games of 1995, not only in its genre. It's a turn based mix of global strategy, base management, and tactical combat with some light role playing elements. Oh, I think I failed to mention it just now when talking about UFO, that it too has some RPG mixed into it all. Anyway, Terror from the Deep takes place 40 years after the first game and assumes that the player managed to defeat the alien plague. Interesting assumption, given that the UFO was unforgiving and you were nearly always one mistake away from losing your best squad and henceforth forfeiting the future of Earth. Still, in XCOM, in the recent years, alien sightings have resurfaced again and especially in the last few months became more and more common. These sightings, however, very quickly turned into activities and the aliens now are even more destructive and dangerous than they ever were. This time, however, they are not coming from above, but from below, from depths of the oceans. Now, gameplay-wise, XCOM's literally no different at all to UFO. And good, because there was nothing wrong with that one and you don't fix what works. But if I'm to be honest, I wouldn't mind seeing presentation get a bump up to high res as VGA. It didn't happen, but I suppose if you want to pop out such a huge content-wise game and an excellent follow-up in a span of just a year, then even in the 90s some corners had to be cut and some assets were used. And frankly, I'm good with that. XCOM is not identical to UFO though. Tactical encounters can now take place both on land and underwater and require not only use appropriate gear, but also weapons that can be used under surface. Granted, it's an early game gimmick, as along with time spent with the game, weapons quickly evolve to become universal and have no limitations, but it's a nice touch even if short-lived. What's interesting about XCOM though is that while it takes place 40 years after the original, we're left with virtually no tech from the first encounter. We have no plasma weapons or alien technologies, even though we were using and manufacturing this all the time. But I suppose the removal was needed for gameplay loop and progression purposes. XCOM is even more difficult than its predecessor was, which means it may not be the best game in the series for someone to start their adventure with tactical squad based strategies. But in the same time, it's an excellent treat to those who completed and replayed the first title to death. It's just great. I'm sure that some of you have been grinding their teeth not seeing Jagged Alliance take the cake for 1995, but fear not. 
While Moby Games may have picked XCOM for the spot, in 1996 they turned into standalone expansion, arguably even better than the original Jagged Alliance was. Arguably, because while the first game took place on a single island and had an overarching plot to follow and work towards, Deadly Games is a set of linear mercenary missions where you lead your team through all of them, conquering more and more demanding challenges. Some may find the lack of a story and strategy player lacking, but I didn't mind it as much, at least not back in the day. It's because Jagged Alliance's strategy player was never as good as the one in the UFO or XCOM was, so not something I was heavily invested in, and frankly speaking, I found tree planting and guard recruitment rather tedious. I loved the combat though and had more than enough of it here. The other thing that was changed from the base game, and one that I actually did actively despise, was the turn limit, meaning each mission had a set number of turns to complete, so you either had to play more aggressively than you would have otherwise, or treat them as tactical puzzles to solve, getting the best outcome possible while sustaining the smallest in scope losses, keeping your mercs in tip top form for the next mission to come. But along with questionable bad and irrelevant changes also came the good ones, and quite a few of these actually. New mission types were added, tons of new weapons and gear, 10 new mercenaries, as polarizing as the original were, a co-op multiplayer mode, which you know, in games like this one is more than fun, and a built-in campaign editor. And I don't have to tell you how much I love these. I mean, even if I don't use them myself as much, having access to user-created content, new, longer, better or more creatively put together missions and campaigns is just great. Gameplay-wise, Deadly Games is super fun. You begin by picking up to 6 mercenaries and equipping them, and then you jump straight into missions. And since you have access to all the original and new mercs, there is a lot of them to pick from. They all differ not only in their specializations and stats, but also in their origins and characters, meaning that they all may have histories with one another and particular opinions on how they're being teamed up. Some may straight up refuse to join your band of merry killing machines just because someone else is already in the party, or on the flip side, work better because they're with someone they enjoyed the company of. It's mechanically a simple concept, but adds a lot to the atmosphere of running your merc squad and managing different characters and not just quote-unquote units on the map. And since we've somehow landed on the map, let's talk about combat. It's naturally turn-based, otherwise Deadly Games wouldn't have landed in this video, and it uses action points for all that you can do each turn. And as long as you have them, action points that is, you can take as many actions as you'd like, be it attacks, movement, stance change, picking up, dropping or using of objects, opening locked doors, containers and the likes, doing anything really. And each merc has their own set of these entirely dependent on his slash her stats. And these stats are not superficial either. Their health, agility, dexterity, wisdom, medicine, explosive mechanics and marksmanship, and they influence nearly everything in the game. Deadly Games may have dropped the overarching strategic background and focused on squad tactics, which many may have not liked, but personally, I was fine with it, as I was never big on gardening and farmer training. Yeah, it's a job at main series entry. War. War never changes. Nope. Sorry, wrong script. Let me start again. Where do I have it? Where do I... Oh, here it is. Okay, let's see. War. War never cha... Ah, god damn it. Hey Google, where's my XCOM Apocalypse script? Oh well, seems I'll have to improvise a little. So, XCOM Apocalypse is a third game in the original XCOM series and a direct follow-up to Terror from the Deep. It's also a game that turned the entire franchise upside down. And my second most favorite DOS game of 1997, trailing only behind Fallout. After the last war, things have not gone well for humans and most that survived live in a huge self-sufficient city of Mega Primus. The civilization took a while to rebuild, and as soon as everything appeared to be finally changing for the better, strange portals started showing up in the sky over Megapolis. And surprise surprise, it's the aliens again. And this time, they're even more of a threat than ever before, because there's so little of us left. So, XCOM is needed once again to save the day and humanity at the same time. The main core of the series is sustained in the apocalypse, meaning that research, development, resources, slash base micro and macro management, tactical squad-based combat during missions and ship-to-ship -ship air combat respectively are all preserved. A bit changed, sure, but still present in the game and easy to grasp for whomever played the earlier titles. As usual, you will also have to carefully manage your budget, as you're nearly never going to be in a situation where you have too much cash lying around gathering dust. And soldiers, vehicles and scientists all have to be recruited and equipped, to the teeth no less. Now, let's get into what's different, and there's a lot of it. For starters, beautiful detailed SVGA graphics replaced older low-res tile-based 2D engine, and this new presentation allows for much more to be seen at once, making those longer missions easier to manage without having to constantly scroll through huge combat maps. And since we're on the combat, it can be either turn-based or real-time. It's clear that the game was designed with this new real-time approach in mind, but even turn-based lovers such as myself will quickly learn to adapt, 
and either use it or stick to tried and tested turns. I did, played it in turns that is, and didn't felt as if I was missing anything or being handicapped because of that. There are many more interesting maps in Apocalypse to fight with the aliens now too, so you'll be tackling outworldly threat in slums, corporate buildings and their headquarters, glass encased farms, factories, apartment buildings and in the wreckages of downed UFOs to name a few. Most weapons, upgrades and vehicles are entirely new as well and a pleasure to manufacture and then use against the invaders. Many of the aliens are also different and some of them are really imaginative and clearly inspired by the alien franchise of movies. Which you know, fits the game's theme perfectly. The city of Mega Primus, while theoretically being just a location the game is set in, feels alive. It's run by the numerous mega corporations that are constantly at odds with each other and it's them that you have to protect to secure the funding for your progress. Quite often interests of this will clash and directly opposing to one another and you'll need to make difficult choices along the campaign. It's just impossible to please everyone, the sooner you realize it, the better. And if you anger one of the corps enough, it may not only become your enemy and engage you in combat, but even join the alien side. Caution in XCOM should really be applied to any and all big or small day-to-day -day occurrences in the city. If you hire scientists or purchase something, anything, all this have to be delivered to your base and don't just magically appear in it. So transports, as they are on their way, are susceptible to ambushes and attacks and have to be protected. At least if you know that you're at odds with someone or aliens are around. As much as Apocalypse never received as wide popularity and success as the two earlier games did, it was an amazing, even if underrated title and all fans of originals, if they only give it a chance, will most definitely love it. It's a true sequel and not an add-on or a reskin that the terror from the deep to a certain degree was, and a good time for weeks on end. I promise. Well no, scratch that. Good time if you're good enough to answer the call that is, because failing in XCOM is always an option too. Crazy Chaos is a turn-based tactical squad-based strategy with no complicated deep or thorough background to the conflict. In fact, there isn't any. There are two sides, grey and brown cows, they don't differ in anything other than the color and they really, really don't like each other. Nearly as much as you dislike that quote-unquote friend of yours that's always right. I mean he's not, but he will create imaginary arguments and argue about it for the sake of argument only, trying to prove his way, even when he's clearly in the wrong. You know, the annoying dude in your friends group. For cows, it may be the race thing or perhaps one side was oppressing the other in the past or even there's no reason for it all, they just don't like each other and that's just how it is. Never mind. What's important here though is that they battle it out to see who'll win. Each of the herds start with no weapons at all and have to acquire them to assume certain roles on the battlefield. So, by picking one of six kinds of scattered around it weapons of shotgun, bazooka, katana, mines, kuathili stick, which I no doubt mispronounced here, or scuba gear, they assume the role corresponding to the weapon. If any of your cows already has a weapon and picks up another, the old one will be dropped on the ground for another cow to use. If you control a farm, it will produce new cows every now and then at random intervals, so having access to one is a huge boost, allowing you to reinforce your armies for the challenge ahead. While the gameplay itself is rather simple, at least when compared to all other titles we've spoke about today, Crazy Cows actually takes terrain conditions under consideration and movement speed is affected by it. Also, going into desert or mountains will decrease your cow's health, so should be done only when there's no other choice or when the tactics require that for victory. There are two game modes in Crazy Cows, War and Battle. First is your campaign, where you progress through 16 more and more demanding stages, and second allows you to play out a single battle against CPU or another player on a single map, either built-in or custom-made using very simple and approachable map editor. While Crazy Cows is neither as deep or as feature-packed experience as most other games in today's video are, it's still quite fun, especially if you have someone with you and both of you enjoy tactical games. How did you like the list? I mean, when it comes to most genres, I usually feel like I would change quite a few choices as compared to what Moby Games users picked, but this one? Well, I'm generally speaking content with the picks that were made. What about you? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.